Good morning, everybody. Today is Sunday, November 3rd, 2019. And I give the date uh, when I share somewhat from the Catholic Mass verses for today's date. And I just share that. Just I use those scriptures because many, many different uh, Christians throughout the world will be reading those verses today. And so, in a sense, it's, uh, I found it beneficial sometimes to do that. And I'll try to talk about a couple of other uh, issues that took place in the world without just getting political or news itself, but issues of the heart. The two themes that I felt would I wanted to speak on were the love of God and a pure and a clean heart. And as I was debating to share from some of the verses for today's date, uh, so they actually would fit in somewhat. The first reading would be from 1 Thessalonians, the last couple of verses in chapter 1, and a, f a couple of verses in chapter 2. I'll, I'll try to read a little bit and quote some today. Uh, we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling, and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. The good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. That the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you, and ye in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul was praying for these Christians at Thessalonica, that it would be glorified in them. In my own reading, the last uh, week or so, through the Gospel of Mark and uh, the Book of Acts and some Old Testament readings, but I came across, again, the occasion where the Pharisees would come to Jesus and accuse him that, <laughs> why are your disciples not washing their hands? The Pharisees had a tradition of the elders which was a tradition that developed among the community of the Pharisees in the time of period before the time of Christ. In the Old Testament, Protestants, the last book of the Bible is Malachi. In the first, the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, first book of the New Testament, uh, Matthew. And our Catholic friends have the Apocrypha that covers some history in that missing years from Malachi to Matthew, about a 400-year period. But the Pharisees rose up as a group of religious adherents that wanted to try to say, we're going to maintain our traditions and our religion and get back to God, even though they were indeed under occupation by other governments, other countries that ruled over them, which was their same position, by the way, in the first century of Rome. In a sense, they were under occupation by the Roman Empire. So, in, in a good way, maybe in the beginning, they developed, and that's where you more than likely had the rise of the synagogues and the Pharisees and so forth in that period of time. But they also developed what was referred to as the tradition of the elders. So when we read the rebukes of Jesus against the traditions of men, He's primarily talking about that. Now, it could apply to traditions that we develop as Christians as well as over time. But there are also good traditions that Christians have. Historic Christianity that has traditions or things that the Lord allows to develop over a period of time in the history of Christianity. And they're not all uh, bad in the sense that we even read Paul saying... Uh, verses about hold to the traditions, meaning there are Christian things that are okay. So when Jesus is rebuking the tradition of the elders, he was rebuking that which I just explained. Now, one of their traditions they developed, they had like a fanaticism of outward washing. And it, it speaks to the heart because it seems as if in the Old Testament, you had labors and washings and things that God instituted. And when he gave Moses the tabernacle and water represented a type of a cleansing, type of a washing. And we read of the baptism of John. When John was baptizing, 
in the wilderness and calling people to repentance, uh, there wasn't a lot of questions about, what is this thing you're doing, John, baptizing in the Jordan? Because they had that understanding that God had used these types of things in the Old Covenant to represent cleansing and washing. But now, in the mind of the religious Pharisees, they got compulsive about it. And maybe one of the reasons was because that inner guilt. I, I've heard testimonies over time, just over the years, maybe a woman that was involved in prostitution or whatever, I can't remember exactly, but I remember hearing, like, she would always try to wash herself because she couldn't get rid of the uncleanness that maybe she felt the guilt. And so maybe that developed with Pharisees because that was one of their compulsions, their traditions. And they would accuse Jesus in the Gospels, why are your disciples not washing their hands in that compulsive way? And so then he would get to the heart of the issue. And he would, he would rebuke them and say, but you also reject the commandment of God, so you would keep your traditions. And he would rebuke them that they developed one tradition that said, whatever you vow to the temple of God, whatever finances or resources that you vow to God, the Pharisees taught, you are no longer responsible to take care of your father or your mother, your elderly parents, which the scripture teaches that children do bear a responsibility to honor their father and mother. So their tradition was, if you vow it to the, to the church, if you will, or to the temple, you are no longer under that requirement of God. And Jesus told them, he said, it is through your tradition, that particular one, they'd say it is korban, a gift. If they dedicated the money they were supposed to use to honor their parents, if they dedicated it to the temple, then the Pharisees said, you are free from that requirement. And he, re Jesus rebuked them and said, that particular tradition, Korban, is nullifying the word of God. And then when he gets into the discourse about this, remember, one of the themes today is that the name of the Lord Jesus Christ would be glorified in you. And so then this is the famous teaching of Jesus, where he says, whatever is without a man, outside of a man, entering into him. Now, why would he discuss that? Because of this compulsive thing about the washing of the hands, making sure everything is clean, so we don't put nothing dirty into us, that compulsive obsession. So that's why he gets into this discourse about, it's not whether a particular thing, you know, dirt might get into you and uh, ceremonially unclean because of a certain thing you touched and ate, but it's the things Jesus said that proceed out of the heart that defile the man. He's, and then when he explains that to the disciples, he says, anything that you put in you, in the physical body, it's going to pass through the physical body. Digestion and going to the bathroom, basically. He says, those things, those physical dirty elements, don't go into your heart. But Jesus says, but out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, murders, fornications, deaths. Out of the heart those things come. And Jesus said, those are the things that defile a man. And so the Pharisees had this outward understanding of what it meant to be outwardly clean, a servant of God, uh, what we're going to do for God and so forth. But inwardly, he said they were like sepulchers or like graves, that on the outside of them they made them nice and white, but on the inside they were full of dead men's bones. Isn't that a lot of wisdom? He said those graves look nice on the outside, but inside they're full of dead men's bones, applying it to the outward religious acts that people could get into and not realizing that there's issues of the heart that are still needing to be cleansed. Or need, we need to glorify the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, not only something that we confess with our lips, which we do, but that in us that name would be glorified. Christianity has had a lot of wonderful movements throughout the history of Christianity, and some movements focused more on the interior life, 
you had various movements that focused on the outward gifts of the spirit at times in the history of Christianity and these were wonderful times and wonderful things but then you had other Christians that said now we need to focus on the holiness of heart and so there was a balance of what we do as believers what we do as ministers as Christians as well as what's inside of us okay uh, the next scripture which would be for today's mass November 3rd 2019 it's uh, Luke 19 and it's the popular story I think I used to have this on cassette tape maybe the little Christian tapes I got it back in the old days with for my children and it, it, I was also dealing with maybe regrets about not, you know, doing the best for my kids. That's been on my mind, you know, the last few weeks as well. But this came to my mind uh, when I reread the story of Zacchaeus the last few nights getting ready to speak on it. And so Zacchaeus, Jesus was passing through Jericho. And at first I thought, when, before I read it, I said, oh, this will be the story of Jericho which is the other one of the Good Samaritan, that a man was taken by thieves. But this is a different one. And so as he's coming through the city, through the town, passing through, at this stage in the ministry of Jesus, uh, we read in the Gospels that his fame spread abroad. And as he's doing these wonderful miracles, there were times where he couldn't have a moment of being alone. He would go to pray, continue all night in prayer to God, to the Father, and there were times where things were pressing on him, and the common people, the scripture says, heard him gladly, and most of us are familiar in the New Testament with the these divisions between the Pharisees, the religious class, and Jesus' embrace of sinners, and there were outward sinners, people that were known to be in adultery and prostitution and all types of things that the religious class was divided between, if you will, those that were considered a lower class. And we read about those things, and they would accuse Jesus of being a friend of sinners. And so those particular sins of the flesh, and when they would accuse, they'd bring a woman taken in adultery in John's Gospel and say, we caught this woman in adultery in the very act. Moses, the scripture says she should be stoned. What do you say? And Jesus famously would say, let him that is without sin among you cast the first stone. And they went out one by one, convicted. And Jesus said, no man condemns you. No man need do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. So now we, we understand in the Gospels, these people that were the lower classes of society that struggle with all these things. And Jesus would associate himself with them, love them, and never justify sin. Never, never say, you know, I love you the way you are. I love you and I love the sinner, but I'm here to deliver you from that. That the name of the Lord Jesus Christ be glorified in you. But now with this man Zacchaeus, it says he was a chief among the publicans, the uh, King James says. He was a chief among the tax collectors. Now they were, you could say, like a different class of them of their own. Maybe like a white collar crime. The tax collectors in first century Rome, the Jewish people had different responses to being, if you will, under occupation by the Roman government. And the Roman government had a certain way that the Jewish people could live their own, regulate their own uh, court system and order and so forth. And we read of the various herods that were like over the particular district of Israel, if you will. And so they had a degree of independence. Uh, we call that Hellenization, and that came really from Alexander the Great. And so when another it started with him, and when one government would conquer another government, you would allow them to keep a decree of or, a degree of autonomy. And so they could still regulate themselves, but you understood that they were under the government of Rome or under the other government that took control of them. And so some Christians, uh, we read in the New Testament of different groups of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes. There's one that's not mentioned, but those were the Essenes that arose, you know, a couple of 
centuries, century and a half, maybe before the time of Christ. And these were the people that just went out and kind of lived separated. And we credit them with the finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls. That was a famous find in the 20th century, historic find. So maybe that group were the ones that kind of put the, we recovered the Dead Sea Scrolls archaeology from. The tax collectors, they were considered sellouts. This man Zacchaeus, if you will, he would maybe be hated not only by the Pharisees, Sadducees, so forth, but even the common people, you see. Even, even the average person, the ones that Jesus did associate with, the ones in open sin, they also didn't like these tax collectors because they were considered sellouts to the government of Rome. Their position was, like, we're just going to get along with them, and we're even going to work for them. We're going to collect taxes. And they were known to be corrupt, and it was like a common, I guess, experience that you have this position, and part of the fringe benefits is you're going to actually collect more than you're supposed to, and you're going to kind of keep that. Now, this man, Zacchaeus, it says he was rich, and he was chief among the tax collectors. And we're going to see in his own mouth that he's going to admit some wrongdoing. So in this day, an interesting thing happened in Luke, whatever chapter we're in, chapter 10. As Jesus was passing through, this man Zacchaeus and all the people, there's this big group of people, this big press of people that are trying to get close to Christ. I might go a little long today, we've not made one in a while. And so he climbs up in the King James Version, says a sycamore tree, so he could get the, a glimpse of this Messiah, this, this one that, you know, the people are, had questions about in that day. The common people are receiving him. The religious leaders are saying he's a blasphemer. They're accusing him of blasphemy against God, that he casts out demons by Beelzebub. So there was, there was a controversies of Christ as he's fulfilling the mission of the Father. And many people wanted personal one-on-one -on -one access and time because they understood also the tremendous, the anointing of the Spirit of God and the miracles that were taking place. And I don't think Zacchaeus, it doesn't seem as if he would think he would be one that would get a personal invitation from Christ because there were so many that wanted that type of one-on-one -on -one with him. So he just climbed into a tree to see him as he passes because Zacchaeus was short. And so as Jesus passes under the tree, he looks up and he gives the name. Could be that he, he that was like a prophetic thing at that moment. But he said to Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, come down. Today I'm going to be at your house. It's interesting. And Zacchaeus... Uh, possibly just fit the mold that others had of him. He got into understanding that his job was a hated job, that people did not like him, and rightfully so, people did hate the dishonesty that came along with that position Zacchaeus held. But maybe he just accepted, this is my plight, this is how people view me, and that's how I've learned to live in this first century. That's my decision that I came to be, you know, a part of associated with Rome in such a way that my fellow Jews hate me. So now for Jesus to associate this day with Zacchaeus was different. Because, like I said earlier, even some of the poor and the downcast and downtrodden, to associate with them, they, they understood. But to then take this make this association with Zacchaeus, it, it was almost like all the sides would be against this type of thing. And when he does this invitation to Zacchaeus, today's the day I'm going to buy it at your house, they actually said he has gone in the text to be a friend, uh, to be with someone that's a sinner. The accusation was made. Now, we don't read Jesus in this chapter openly rebuking Zacchaeus or openly telling him, look, you've taken wrongfully, you've done a lot of bad, and you need... The repentance seemed to have come just by the fact 
that he looked up at that day, at that moment, and said, I'm going to be with you in this day, Zacchaeus. I'm going to associate with you, who are hated by just about everybody, even a lot that are following me, Christ himself. But yet I'll, I'll take that risk, if you will, and associate with you in this day. Now what Zacchaeus does tell Jesus, and it seems like it just comes because of the love of Christ to be there at that moment. And he says, if I have taken anything wrongfully, I will restore it fourfold, which he did take wrongfully. And I will give half my goods to the poor. And he's, and Jesus, I, and if I'm in the chapter, I can read it, oh, I'm in Thessalonians. He said, but this man is also a son of Abraham, this Zacchaeus. This day salvation has come to your house. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And so not only was Jesus there, as we are familiar with, with those that were openly adulterous sinners and so forth, but he was also there to deal with that heart, if you will, of the white-collar criminal. The one that managed to survive in society, managed to say, but there are corners that we, you know, cut corners. We do things that are wrong. And he even spoke to that heart, to that heart. Zacchaeus, you have to have a pure heart. You, you might be in a position in society that you're doing well and you're successful and you're not openly, you know, in sin like some of the others, but the things that you're doing are still false and wrong. And, 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 and that has to be turned from and it was on that day. And so that's the famous uh, story of Zacchaeus, which was a wonderful children's song. There is one verse that's called the Alleluia, from when I get this from the Catholic bishop's lectionary, and it was simply John 3.16. And that would be like the verse that our Catholic friends would use in the Mass, just maybe as a song, part of the the singing of the liturgy, but which, which of course was a theme that I felt the Lord wanted us to speak on, the love of God. Let me try to share a few stories and maybe get to the psalm. The psalm for today's reading was Psalms 45, and I hope I, I remember to get to it. Uh, this week, I saw some of my friends, my homeless friends, and I have a friend for quite some time that I would visit. He has a wonderful house right off of the water, and he lives on a fishing pier. And I used to go out there a lot and just sit with my friend. And I would see some of these visits, like when I would visit Pops, just visits, maybe like a pastoral visit, like a pastor would visit some of his friends. And so it, when I would make these visits, it was just sort of like, okay, today I'm with this friend, and I'll spend an hour with them, and I just it was like a fulfilling thing to occupy your time. Last few years, I might not have gone to see my friend as much, but then he had cancer he was struggling with, and still is, and he had a severe operation. They took a huge tumor out of his abdomen. I visited him at that time in the hospital a couple years ago, a year and a half ago, and then he had a recurrence of it, so he's not feeling well. And obviously his struggles physically are much more than any of the uh, struggles I mentioned recently with dealing with, you know, uh, whether it's a depression or whatever. But he had a particular, uh, he's getting chemo treatments and he had a particular patch they gave him, I forget what it was for pain, but it, me it messed with his mind. And he said he felt very disoriented and he'd get up at night and not be able to sleep and so he wanted to get off of that and, and in a small degree I, I have some of those same issues and so I've just been visiting him believe I believe God for healing and me and a Christian friend pray for his healing but I also felt like it was uh, some of my friends have passed away and this is not a negative confession I would ask for you as you see the video on this particular day, you can pray for him, please. His name is Don. And if you see these in the future, just remember to pray for the oppressed. In my prayer time, there's a particular time I 
set aside to pray for all the oppressed, all those throughout the nations that are in oppression. I pray that also for the persecuted church. Then I pray for all the prisoners. Let the sign of the prisoners come before you and according to the greatness of your power, preserve those that are appointed unto death. And so I just mentioned this particular case with my friend because I felt more to just uh, try to communicate the peace of God when I'm with him, gratitude, being grateful, understanding that there does come a day for all of us where we believe in healing and I don't want to give negative confessions. I just felt like instead of the struggle, sometimes people uh, embrace healing in certain Christian groups and it's, it, they, it puts pressure on people to believe for a certain thing or whatever. And I just felt like it was better to just... I visit more often because I'm not sure how long my friend will be around. And he, he was sharing his past with me. He used to kind of... He grew up like he, they sent him to a reform school when he was younger. And he's told me some of this history, a lot of rejection from his family that carried with him throughout his life. Just the other day when I was with him, he was recounting another story. And another a homeless friend of mine showed up, and my friend did not get to finish the story. My friend Don was telling me when he was in that reform school in another state many, many years ago when he was younger, where he experienced a lot of his rejection, that he was with. He said there were some other kids that were in that juvenile detention facility and he said, did I ever tell you about that one, John? And I, I said, I don't think you did, don't. And there were some other young kids there that they, they were out hunting one day. And they saw a man, fix, an older man, working on his truck out in a field somewhere, whatever state this was. And they just decided to shoot that man. And as Don was telling me, the kids recounted the story to my friend Don when he was in that reform school. And then they went up to him, and the, and the older man just looked up and said, why me? And they killed him. And it was right at that moment he didn't get to finish telling me the story, and I, another friend showed up. And I just, I'm looking at, you know, the trajectory of things in life, and looking at the decisions, and, and, and you can go down courses and roads in life, and you're not recognizing, you know, the dangers involved in those things. And that was just one story I, I kind of wanted to bring up. I might mention one other one. Uh, the football game. This last few weeks, uh, a lady friend of mine that's a friend of some of my homeless friends, but I know her, I used to be friends with her ex-husband, Darrell, many years ago. And she told me how her daughter, they're going through many struggles, but her daughter went to the football game and the homecoming parade and I said you know I never went to the football games now my children are four girls and they played uh, kickball or whatever and I did go to those but I kind of thought I neglected a lot of things I should have done and oftentimes it's because we want to do ministry we want to do ministry and a lot of times we're driven by that and I know that it's a noble goal for all my friends out there that are doing ministry because uh, we have callings upon us. But at the same time, I think many times, and in my case, I've, I see I had neglected things. And so yesterday I went to the first football game ever at the stadium where my kids attended school. One of my daughter's friends had her son playing in a football game. And it was like the first day I ever went. All my children, all the years, they used to go to the football games. So I neglected that. And so yesterday, I, in a sense, I made up with it for it in a small way. And you can't capture the things that maybe uh, you intended to do throughout your life. Remember, you don't, at those moments, uh, at those times, uh, remember the things that are important. Let me get to the psalm. The Psalm 45, and maybe one more story. But the, the theme was that the name of the Lord Jesus Christ would be glorified in us, in us. 
that like the Pharisees and others, Jesus actually said this people in that uh, chapter I read that I mentioned a little bit, he said, he quotes Isaiah, he says, well has Isaiah prophesied of you, this people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So there's a danger that we could have the good confession, Jesus is Lord, and yet our hearts being far, that that name is not actually being glorified inside of us. And so that's the Psalm 45, and I did read it uh, thinking, you know, we'll discuss it today, which would be part of the Mass. My heart is indicting in a good manner. I like this a few elements. I have, my tongue is the pen of a ready writer. I like that. Open your mouth and I will fill it. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. The volume of the book it is written in me. There is a dynamic among those that are in ministry that God says, when you open your mouth, I will fill it. Now, that's it, it's a good gift. There are people that have been uh, speakers for many years. And what you learn over time is when you open your mouth, you're going to communicate and God will fill it. And so some people, my friend Don, he says, uh, he don't like being on video. He said, because I can't maybe communicate as well. Or, so we have recognized that God has blessed different gifts in the church. And yet Paul will teach us in Corinthians that it would be wrong to exalt people per, because they might have a particular gift. He says, one word is one plans, but God provides the increase, giving an example of himself and Apollos. So there's this blessing that the tongue of the pen of a ready writer, and maybe others say, I wish I was able to communicate or speak. If that's not the gift that you have, Paul tells us in Corinthians, that the more notable gifts are not the more important gifts, but the ones that maybe we deem less noticeable. And so that's another danger, I guess, that we should be aware of. It's easy to uh, make a lot of teaching videos or maybe to get caught up in the whole process of being able to communicate. A lot of good men, and I want to bless all my friends that are pastors in the city. I pray for you regularly. But I don't just pray for the local scene, but I do. Every church in the city I pray for twice a week. Not by name. But all the churches in the city, and I do have a few by name that I mention, some that I often visit, but then I pray for the whole church worldwide. Your house, Father, is a house of prayer for all people. Let all the nations be gathered together. Let all the people be assembled. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. So we try to stay connected locally and globally in that prayer time. When I don't feel well <laughs> and things are disorienting, I, there was a scripture the Lord gave me, and even when I was up in the Northeast and New York and everywhere, it says, I call upon God from the end of the earth. Lead me under the rock that is higher than I. Here we have no continuing city. We seek one to come. In the mornings when I look at the stars and pray, and then in the evening, I, because I would try to get up early when it was still dark, still do, and then in the evening, and But looking at a distance, if, if you feel disoriented, like things look dizzy to you, you don't like being inside, you don't like being in a room, but I noticed, I learned over these last seven years or so, that if you look at a distance, things are not disorienting. So you try to have a window that you can look at. But then I also realized I got familiar with the different star patterns. And I thought one day... You know, God makes this great promise to Abraham in Genesis 15 and Genesis 12. And I'm going to make of you a great nation, get out of your country from your kindred, from your father's house. And then he takes him outside and taught this a lot. But he says, look at the stars. If you're able to know them, so shall thy seed be. Great promises about the gospel. Christ coming, Paul will teach that in Galatians. But I thought, there's not many things you and I can look at tonight or in early in the morning that are the same things that Abraham looked at. But that's one of them. Look at the stars. Count them. Tell them. Let's finish Psalms 45. My heart is in dining good man. Tongue is pen of a ready writer. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. 
The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Evil men understand not judgment, but they that seek the Lord understand all things. Evil men, the unrighteous part of humanity, doesn't understand judgment. But they that the judgments of the Lord are true, and they are righteous altogether. So now when David came under judgment for his sin by God, he would say, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And he would say that God was justified in the judgment that took place in the life of David. Now evil men, when judgment comes, James says, don't judge your brother. It's interesting. He says, if you judge your brother, you're judging the law. And he that judges the law is not a doer of the law, but a judge. And James will, and the letter of James, and that the law, it, it reveals us to us, like a mirror, if you will. It has, does not have the capability to change us, but it brings us to Christ. And, and so the law is given for us not to see the wrong in our brother. We love our brothers and sisters. And, and let him that is spiritual restore such a one. If a man's in a fault, let him that is spiritual restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Concern himself, lest he also be tempted. But there's this principle that if we are righteous, just, evil men do not understand judgment. They respond to judgment. They, they look at the other, wanting them to be judged. They also sometimes rejoice at the judgment of an enemy not realizing that that's not something we're supposed to grab hold of. Recently, somebody asked me, in the world affairs that go on, somebody asked me about, we might go an hour today, how I felt that a particular terrorist leader in Syria recently was uh, killed. He actually was, uh, American troops found out where he was, he was a leader of ISIS, and he always had a suicide vest, thinking if the time ever came, he would blow himself up. And he was in a tunnel. U.S. forces found where he was at. They raided that encampment, and he blew himself up along with his two children in a tunnel. And somebody asked me, and this is not to be, uh, to, it's just, what did I feel about that? Things that take place in the world, I understand. There are wars, there are things, there are... How, what is the position? I thought it's tragic that anybody, whether it's a Muslim or whoever it happens to be, the Satan it says, has blinded the minds of those that do not believe the gospel. And it's tragic that anybody would be in deception and take the, his own children with him by suicide because he doesn't want to be caught and be accountable for things. So now I did not rejoice, and this is not to judge or to get political, but I really did not rejoice. And when Jesus says we love our enemies, that means there are real people that fit the category of enemies. And the position of the Christian, of the church, there are different things that countries do militarily and so forth, but the position of the church is to love the enemy. Now, I'm not being a pacifist, though there are Christian movements that espouse that. I'm simply saying, do, are we examining our hearts? Are there people today that if they were killed, that you could rejoice in that? When Jesus said, greater love is no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends, oftentimes that verse is used as we as a country and, and the Western world, uh, we honor those who died in service and so forth. And sometimes that verse is used, they hear it come up. But that scripture is not talking about trying to being engaged in any military conflict, trying to kill the enemy, the enemy's trying to kill you, and then if you kill the enemy, 
that enemy dies, but then possibly in those wars, an enemy might kill you. We honor all those that have given their lives. But that scripture, greater love is no man than this, and a man will lay down his life. It was a scripture from the lips of Jesus, who when they came to take Jesus, Peter would pull out his sword, cut off the, the ear of the high priest, uh, the servant of Malchus, and Jesus would look to Peter and say, put up your sword. Those that live by the sword are going to die by the sword. And so this, that scripture was not a scripture saying there, were, there was a competition of violence and one would die and the other would prevail, but it was a scripture where Jesus said, for the church, for the Christian, that violence or death or killing is not the ultimate answer. And if, if you are to love your enemy, I'm not speaking about militaries that have to serve and do certain things, but I'm talking about the heart. So I thought it was tragic that anybody would be in deception to a degree where he would blow himself up and his kids. Though things have to happen in societies. Uh, thou, hatest, thou lovest righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed with you all the gladness above thy fellows. A prophecy of Christ. Because you love righteousness and you hate wickedness. Therefore God, even thy God, is anointed with all of gladness. And one that I felt fit from Psalms 45, the king's daughter is all glorious within. Talks about the outward covering of the king's daughter. We are the bride. You know, we are the king's children, sons and daughters of God. But it's within that she is glorious, that the name of the Lord Jesus Christ would be glorified in you which is the theme for this day. If I were to tell one more story, it would be, I think I covered everything that I wanted to cover. Creating me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew right spirit within me. And I won't get a chance to cover an interesting interaction I had with a Muslim person one day and how it came to pass. But to just in our theme for this day, to recognize the love of God. The one Alleluia verse that I mentioned was the Jesus himself in John chapter 3. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believes is not condemned. But he that does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in that testimony. Now, John's beloved, First John, uh, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. And it, John says, and we have believed the love that God hath toward us. Do we believe the love that God has toward us? I watched a documentary. I'll share this one. It'll be short and we'll end it. But it was the story of Rich Mullins. And it's a wonderful movie. I watched it a few years ago. But it, Rich Mullins was a famous Christian singer. And he was... Uh, the one I remember is Our God is an Awesome God. Recently, I listened to Keith Green, which was a wonderful Christian. Uh, he had a great influence on my early conversion and the years of ministry. And I if any of my friends have never, please go to YouTube and just Google Keith Green and listen to some of his songs. We associated a lot of his music with the early days of the ministry. But in the Rich Mullins documentary, it showed how, though he was a Christian singer, he also had a lot of problems with like the entertainment mentality of Christian musicians and all. And I did not realize he struggled with alcoholism. And yet he struggled with issues of the heart. Issue, very good uh, ragamuffin band or whatever it was called. But at one point, and it was a, you know, a true life movie about his life. And a friend of his said, I want you to listen to this cassette tape or whatever. They were in a vehicle from a preacher that I heard. And I believe the real preacher was in the movie, probably played that role. But it was a man that, whatever ministry or church or whatever it was, 
and you could hear the words in the documentary. And the man said, now what, how accurate everything is, but the man said, I'm convinced that the Lord Jesus will ask us one question at the judgment. And Rich Mullins, who his friend said, I know you don't like to listen to preachers, because Rich Mullins felt there was too much, you know, performance and all. But then he heard the man in the movie make that statement, that there's one question that Jesus will ask us at the judgment. And it was, do you believe that I loved you? And then Rich Mullins stops the vehicle and he gets out. And has like this moment with God. And then throughout the movie it shows that uh, he became friends with this particular preacher. Who also I think struggled in the movie that with alcoholism or other things. But it, made, it had an impression on me. Because John says, we, John the Apostle says, and we have believed that the love that God has towards us. And so in many of the things that we uh, teach and reach out, and there are so many good things that we can, you know, find in Scripture. Uh, but the mission that Jesus was on, greater love has no man than this, that a man will lay down his life for his friends. He expressed his love in, he, in what he did. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe upon him should not perish but have everlasting life. And our goal, as people that are communicating, if I look at the perceived enemy, whoever is in this world today, and many are in darkness, many are in deception, yes, indeed, religious deception and things of like that, all of that. But do I really love the enemy? Do I really love the enemy or the perceived enemy? Would we be willing to uh, lay down our lives for, for one another? Not in a scenario like that you're out to kill another and the other. Have. What about that if you felt that laying down your life for that enemy would really make a difference? And so these are issues of the heart I think that we would uh, look at today. Uh, we'll, we're going to end it. I think we covered just about all of the scriptures. And, uh, and pray that we would just, where we're at, at this time today is, uh, I guess, November 3rd, 2019. I have not made a lot of uh, Sunday teachings. I felt it was good, at least for this day, to connect. The, king, uh, the king's daughter is all glorious within. And I, I guess it's hard uh, if you were going to teach a message about creating me a clean heart, oh God, and renew right spirit within me. It's still easy to, to honor with our lips and our heart being far. It's still easy to honor with our lips and our hearts being far. It's still easy to, to hear words that are being communicated for all of us. And to, and to not really have that experience. That the great reformer in the, a little bit more, uh, Martin Luther, and the great reformation and reformation history, and I like history, and the 1500s, and we understand the rise of the Protestant movement and the things that took place at that time in the history of man. But they asked Luther once, what about the monasteries? What about people and monks, Luther? That monks and monasteries, which Luther had that history himself, before he broke away from the Catholic Church. And it's interesting because he answered in a way that says he wasn't out and out against it because some of the things that developed were good things. They did okay. They helped the poor. One of the bad things of the Reformation, if you will, was when a lot of the monasteries and, and Catholic uh, institutions for reaching out to the poor, particularly in England, over after the Reformation and the Church of England and so forth, a lot of those were uh, dismantled. And it was in the area of charity and charitable outreach to the poor, it, it had a negative effect. But Luther's response was, if being in a monastery and being a monk, which he at one time was, it says, if you can love your neighbor better by doing that, then do it. 
if you can love your neighbor better by not doing it, then don't do it. And that's interesting. Now, whether he changed, I heard that from a reputable scholar teaching at a reformed seminary, you know, it should be legitimate. But his position was one of the heart. If you can love your neighbor more by a particular way of worship of God, then, then go that route. If you can love your neighbor more, uh, if you're called to communicate, then communicate. I found my friend uh, that's very sick that I mentioned, and he was puking up. He's sick. He's on the chemo. And then when the other friend came by, I didn't have time to give him a ride. He had to go get, the other friend had to go get a part in town. And I wouldn't have had time to go into town to the salvage yard to get the part. I knew I didn't have time. My friend, who was sick, I knew he didn't want to do it. But he had told the other guy, I'll give you a ride to help you. And I'd seen him get ready and take him. He did more noble than me. My friend Don did. Because he went out of his way with all the struggles. And so I, we... We look at ourselves in the areas where we have failed and where we have tried our best. And, and if you can love your neighbor, if you can love your enemy, if you could, if we could examine all hearts, uh, then it would benefit everybody. Okay? Let me pray a blessing, and this will be, at least for now, this will be the teaching. How many more? We'll leave that up to God. Father, I thank you for all of our friends. I thank you for all that are in ministry. Any pastors, leaders, uh, teachers, from all the different expressions of the Christian church. Wherever they are at, if, if they stumble across uh, our teachings or our videos, may, may they be built up. May they be strengthened to fulfill the mission. That, and, and let us... Uh, at times realize we have to maybe take a second look at are we going so fast that maybe our hearts are not glorifying, that maybe the Lord is not being glorified in us as much as the giftings are going for it. So it would benefit all of us, Father, if we would just re-examine. Today would be a day of us uh, Examining our hearts like the scripture teaches us. Jesus said it was from the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks, the abundance of the heart. So if, if we have a pure heart, then the issue of sin and the issues of unrighteousness, they can't be changed by an outward thing. So let us uh, have that pure heart. I pray that for all of our friends. I pray for everyone that watches the video today. And I ask a blessing on all of the church. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless everybody.